Welcome to the session um, from Vine to Glass. And this is a deep dive into the supply chain of the wine industry as part of the wine, food, and tourism uh, focus in uh, this year's JobEx. And uh, my name is Paul Henry. I'm an independent wine consultant based in and out of Adelaide. And I've been privileged enough to live here for 10 years, but have had a wine industry background that has included living and working in the UK, continental Europe in terms of France, Italy, and North America. So um, I hope that that qualifies me to be um, in attendance. And I look forward to um, answering your questions, uh, or at least contributing to the panel and the esteemed panel. I will introduce um, forthwith. But I'd like to start by acknowledging a protocol. And um, it's not just a gesture. I think it's very important, because whatever your particular interest in wine, um, I always feel that in some way it's bottled geography. And in every way, it relates to land and landscape and culture. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we meet today on the traditional lands of the Ghana people. And we recognize the role that relationship to country and landscape plays in their custom and in their culture. Um, and we recognize that importance and we show our gratitude for them hosting us here today. Before I introduce the panel and on an extended thought of that idea of country, relationship to land, dare I say it, even belonging to country, one of the things that I've observed in 25 years of working in the wine industry and in particular talking about Australia is if there is a single misconception about Australia in the world of wine, it is that we are a modern industry that's about 25 years old. In fact, we have a rich, a rich and deep history. Barossa, as um, a region, celebrates its 175th anniversary uh, this year. Last week, Pusey Vale Vineyard, Contours Vineyard in the Eden Valley celebrated 160 years. So Australia is not a Johnny-come-lately. It has credibility, it has history, it has antecedents. And for those of you that are familiar with our location today, if you would permit me one observation, and I'd like you to frame this in your mind, because it's what I discovered when I came to Australia 10 years ago, and it still fascinates me and surprises me and motivates me. If you think about that cold basin of water that is um, the Wollonga Basin, at the mouth in McLaren Vale, and you travel 200 kilometers inland to a region such as Clare, that landscape that you're on is between 800 million and a million million years old, a thousand million years old, I beg your pardon. That's extraordinary. And just to put that in a frame in a European context, which tends to be the benchmark against which we look at wine, um, a region like Burgundy in France, rich indeed in history, is Devonian. It's about four million years old. We are on the oldest, most depleted, most ancient, and I believe most hallowed ground in the world. Um, 400 to 800 million years old. I think that's extraordinary. Um, and in that time, that 200 kilometer strip from the Wollonga Basin to the Clare Valley, has in its lifetime twice been the height of Everest in its lifetime. So what I'm trying to get you to, or encourage you to think of, is the rich inheritance of natural history, geography, and geology that we have in this country. And while it is very tempting to call all things Southern Hemisphere the New World, I would suggest to you respectfully in a sense, we're very much the very old world. And I think that's a really important part of our identity. Now, onto the panel proper, who you're going to hear from today. And um, I think it's a really good representative slice of what makes Australia interesting and exciting as a wine community 
and an industry. We have Nadia Blaise from Pernod Ricard Winemakers, who will be our first speaker today. Uh, Nadia will be followed by Dr. Dan Johnson, who is um, the managing director of the Australian Wine Research Institute. Um, a sidebar on that, and to talk about the importance of research and development education and the role that plays in being an innovative industry. I remember a figure, um, and you'll correct me, Dan, because you're good at that. Somewhere along the lines of Australia produces about 6% of um, the world's volume in terms of grapes, but academically we produce about 30% of published third-party peer-to-peer reviewed academic papers on the subject. Perhaps a little less, but you're in the right ballpark. 28%. We punch above our weight. We punch above our weight. So I guess what I'm saying is that sometimes we think it's all about product, but in many instances I think it's also about extension. And Sarah Hill from the South Australia Wine Industry Association, and if there's something internationally that marks out Australia, I think it comes down to some of the very basic structures that we have within our regions and within our states that gives us a cohesive and strong industry fabric and community. And the South Australia Wine Industry Association is that which is responsible for how industry relates to each other and how industry relates to the commercial challenge of what is increasingly a global marketplace. So um, thank you for your patience. I felt it was important to frame some of those in terms of context, but now I'm going to hand you over to um, the panel who will speak and introduce themselves. And we're also going to leave about 10 minutes at the end because you all look curious and inquiring. And I'm sure you have many questions which we will delight in um, helping you find answers to. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Nadia Bless from Pernod Ricard Winemakers. Thank you. Nadia. Thanks so much. Welcome, everyone. It's nice to see some faces out there. Um, I'm Nadia Blaise, and I'm with Pernod Ricard Winemakers. My current role is uh, Regional Learning and Development Manager. But what I'm going to do is walk you through a little bit of my journey and um, how I got here today, because uh, I think that, um, you know, you might be a little bit surprised that I have not always been in the wine industry, and uh, it, I've had a few little twists and turns along the way. All right, so here's me, leaving school, going, what am I going to do? I had no idea. So I did what anyone did that didn't want to go to uni straight away, is I uh, got myself an admin role and uh, off I went to work every day. And during that time, I learnt some very good life lessons about um, customer service and, and how to help people and, uh, and whatnot. And where I landed was actually in property, in real estate. And uh, what, what uh, the knowledge or the, the skills I acquired through that was really about helping people through a transactional period in their life that's actually quite stressful. Um, and as you can imagine, people are either buying or selling or they're trying to find a house to rent. And uh, so I learned some really good on the ground skills that have absolutely set me up for success today. And I wouldn't be where I am today without them. Then I worked out that actually I wanted a little bit more than that and uh, so I did a little bit of study. So I went off to my uh, local TAFE and thought, oh, I'll do a diploma in business and a, a diploma in HR because I thought the idea of HR was quite good. I learnt lots of skills uh, through that. But what actually made more of an impact for me was the experience. And I ended up uh, managing the office I was in um, and had about 15 direct reports. And uh, they range from salespeople to property managers to admin staff. Um, and I was also head of uh, complaints. So uh, that was always, uh, always fun. And uh, again, you got really thick skin in that environment. And uh, at the ripe old age of 22, I had people who were 50 plus that I was managing. And that was, that was a tough pill to swallow um, for them and for me because I had to learn some key leadership skills along the way. In this journey, what has set me up for success today and, and what I teach when I'm delivering leadership programs is, you know, really the skill of coaching has set me up um, 
quite nicely. And I took a little bit of time to learn that coaching is actually really important. And it's a really great skill for everyone to learn. That telling someone what to do actually isn't going to get them where you need to get them. And in fact, I had to, to flick that switch and really take on a bit of a coaching role. So I learnt my lessons the hard way. I had some difficult stuff that I needed to performance manage and whatnot. And that, again, was some great skills. I then managed to uh, move up to the Barossa Valley. So here I am in the beautiful Barossa Valley country, and I thought, what kind of industry should I be part of in this local community? And lo and behold, what is the Barossa Valley known for? It's known for the, the awesome wine industry that, that we have here in South Australia. I knew nothing about the wine industry, I must say. I had a few HR skills, I had a few admin skills and office management skills, but that's all I could offer. I knew nothing else about about the industry itself. So I knew I had to kind of start at ground zero, start again, and get an entry level role um, into an organisation. Now I think I fluked it, but I managed to get that entry level role at Pernod Ricard Winemakers. And uh, I, I definitely say that I, there was a bit of luck, sheer luck in that, but also there was a bit of determination that I knew that the skills I had would relate to the role I applied for. And so what I ended up applying for was the training coordinator role. So very admin, entry level based within the HR team at Pernod Ricard Winemakers. Um, but I knew that I could pick up those skills that I had in that previous job and apply them. And so long as someone was kind of there to coach and guide me on the industry itself and what our employees needed, I knew I could do it. And thankfully I had an amazing uh, manager who could see the connection and really mentored and coached me through that process of, uh, you know, this is what it means for us in the wine industry and, and this is how we help our people grow. So that was 2008 that I actually started in the wine industry. So I've been here in this fantastic uh, spot for almost 10 years. And uh, throughout that journey, I've really just t decided that actually that, that real training, learning and development, helping people grow their careers was the space that I thrived on and I was really passionate about. So I decided at that point, yep, all good. That's where I want to, uh, that's where I want to stay. So slowly but surely, I did a bit more training, realised I needed to go to uni. So I went as a mature age student, uh, did, did university externally so that I could still work full time. So I did that whole part time uni, full time work juggle. Um, and that, uh, that, was, that was good, it was a good job. I did that before having children, um, so I could make that work. And uh, essentially that, that helped um, me then be able to apply for more senior roles in that training and learning space within Penarica Winemakers. I moved to Sydney, uh, when was it, just a year ago, and uh, took on the regional learning and development role, which then meant I was responsible for all of um, learning and development across our employees in Australia and New Zealand. And to give you some context, that's about 1,300 people across Australia and New Zealand. And a big focus for us is leadership and management training, as it is for lots of, of organisations that really want to develop their talent, but also wearing an operational hat, we've, we've got people on the ground in operations that need to be safe, they need to know how to operate plant and machinery, so there's that on the job training as well that's vitally important to our business. Um, so again, I had to wear a couple of different hats, hats doing that. I guess it's some of the areas that I really have been able to see has helped me in this journey is just my will or desire to learn. I was really hungry and I'm still hungry today and I'm actually really passionate, um, you know, as you would hope someone who's responsible for learning and development, that people stay curious, that, that you really are hungry and driven to learn more and I think that's what sets people apart. When you're looking at who's your talent in your organisation, it's people that are always wanting to learn, they ask the right questions and they might not always you know, know all the answers and that's totally fine, but they know, you know what, who to ask or even get pointed in the right direction of who to ask and that's worked quite well. So look, Pernod Ricard Winemakers has uh, been very good to me. We are, as I say, a, a, a great company in Australia and New Zealand. Um, our headquarters is in Sydney. We have a global footprint, so we do have um, wineries in Spain, China, the US. Um, and uh, so we're quite fortunate that we've got a nice global footprint and we're part of the Pernod Ricard um, global company of 18,000 uh, employees. 
So uh, we do have a spirits arm of our business as part of the market company. Um, so we are blessed that we can also uh, get our hands on some good, uh, good Jamison or uh, Absolute as, as well as our, our beautiful Jacobs Creek wines. And uh, with Penara Car, you might be thinking, well, how, what kind of roles are part of that, that business? And most people sort of say, I'm not a winemaker, I'm not a viticulturalist, I, I can't get a job in your business. Well, actually, you can. I mean, there's, there's plenty of roles that we require in order to keep us ticking along. And some of those roles are things like finance. We need finance team members, we need IT team members, and we need legal, um, you need HR, there's lots in the supply chain, you know, right, right from viticulture through to packaging the wine in bottles, you know, you've got to have someone that can make sure the technology's right, have we got the right packaging line to get that bottle down the line? You know, there's lots of different varying roles from very corporate sales and marketing and also operations. So I think from an industry perspective, there's a lot to offer. So there's a lot to, lot to be gained by thinking about the wine industry. So don't disregard us. We have lots to offer. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, it's just about finding the right, the right fit for you. And uh, certainly we're always on the lookout for that talent. We're always on the lookout for the, the next uh, great IT, finance, HR person, as well as our... our fabulous winemakers and, and viticulturalists. Um, so please consider the wine industry. I think, in, especially in South Australia, you'll find that um, we, we do have um, quite a big footprint uh, as an industry itself, and I'm sure Sarah will attest to that. Um, so, but yeah, so that's, that's my journey today. Fantastic, thank you. Um, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, Nadia Blaze. Thank you, it's very kind of you. <laughs> Dan. R&D, education, thank extension. You, Righto, thank you, Paul, and good afternoon, everybody. My journey is, uh, echoes quite a lot of what we've just heard, actually. Uh, a non-linear, circuitous pathway from somebody who has a passion in something and then finds themselves working in the wine industry, but then realising they absolutely love it and stays. Um, the wine sector, as Nadia has touched on, it's tempting to think about the image that is portrayed to you as a wine consumer and assume that that is what working in the wine industry is like. And that's pictures of uh, rolling hills with uh, autumnal vine leaves and um, beautifully artisanally crafted products and so on. People with soil on their shoes and purple teeth or purple hands maybe. Now th that's true, there, there are elements of all of that in, in wine and, and that's the image that the industry loves to portray. It's part of the role of wine as a luxury product, one that uh, commands a premium, it's associated with lots of life's luxuries, and has been part of civilization since, uh, since day dot. But there's also this other layer of, of organizations and support networks that, that exist to make it possible for the producers, that, the grape growers and the winemakers that produce the product that you see in Dan Murphy's or on the, the wine list at a restaurant, to make it possible for them to do what they do very well. The role that I perform is part of that, and that's in and around education and research and development. Now, my passion is more at the latter end of that, particularly. When I was very young, sort of four years old, that sort of thing, I'm on tape in my, in my family home saying, I'm going to be a scientist one day. So I always knew very early on that the thing that, was, that I was really interested in was discovery and learning and being the first person ever except, you know, God and Solomon to, to discover something. It was something that was really, really passioning and uh, occurring for me. And so most of my formative years were spent exposing myself to the hard skills, the STEM subjects, which have gone, gone out of vogue a little bit and then they've come back in in a big way. Lots of incentives now to study STEM subjects. And I continue to feel that that's been essential. Do you just want to, un I'm sure everyone here is familiar with that, but if you STEM. unpack that acronym, that might be useful. Sure. Uh, science, technology, engineering, and maths, STEM subjects. So this is it when you go to school and you've got a choice between doing uh, humanities subjects or, or science subjects or whatever, then for me, it was, the choice was always very clear. I was going to do the, the hard maths, the hard physics, chemistry, biology, and so on, because I just love that stuff. Not everybody does. I, I did. And so I, I exposed myself to a lot of that, and I knew from my late teens that, it, that I con was desperate to continue this career in, in science. 
and formed a mission for myself. I didn't know what sector I was going to work in, for sure, but I knew that by the time I was 30, I was going to have a PhD and an MBA. Now, why, why those two skills? A PhD is the way you earn your stripes in science. You can do a, an undergraduate degree, a Bachelor of Science or something, and that's, that's, you can get very good careers out of that. But the kind of careers that I wanted, which is where you can run your own laboratory and lead a team of people and really do discovery science, required a PhD or a doctorate in philosophy is the actual degree with a specialisation in the sciences. The MBA part, that's a Master of Business Administration, more from the Faculty of Professions part of universities was of interest because that's the way, that, that's the language that the real world speaks. A lot of scientists can be seen to sit in ivory towers and, and be irrelevant and so on. If you want to be doing science that has application, has real world relevance, you need to be able to communicate with the person who owns a vineyard, as I now do, or owns a winery, and is awake all night wondering how they're going to afford water to grow their crop or to manage some trade barrier with a third-party market or, or figure out what a consumer is going to want in three years, not, not today, but planting the things today that the consumer is going to want in a few years' time. They're all real-world concerns. So what I wanted to do was science that had relevance. So I wanted to do those two degrees to get myself in a position to be able to do the kind of job that I currently am. But I still didn't think it was going to be in wine. I thought I was going to cure cancer or that I was going to work in nanotech. Particularly nanotechnology was uh, more of a close personal interest. When I finished my degrees, I was working partly for the South Australian government uh, in giving out uh, grants to biotechnology companies and other startups. And I used to go around to hospitals and universities and talk about how to commercialise science, to take ideas and take them into a useful product into the market. And uh, I used to give those talks, and then one day I gave one at the Australian Wine Research Institute, where I now work. And the then director called me once a week for a year until I said, all right, I'll come and, I'll come and work for you. Because for me, it was, I was going to work in nanotechnology and cure cancer and so on. Wine was, I, I like wine a lot. You know, I like wine on the weekends. I like going to McLaren Vale Barossa and so on. I love consuming the product. But wine science, really? Is that a, is that a thing? Having joined it, this was in the mid-2000s, uh, 11 years later, later, I'm now the managing director of that institute and uh, have loved every day uh, since. When we talk about wine science and some of those other jobs that exist in the, in the wine sector or wine community other than just growing grapes and making wine, a, an example comes right back to a couple of things that Nadia and Paul have said, We're talking about, for example, regions and the uh, ancient soils that Australia has to offer. There's a lot of wine in the world. And one of the things that every producer, every country, every state, as we'll hear in a minute, is trying to do is to differentiate the offering that, that we've got to make it really interesting uh, for the world. And what science does is helps to unravel the, the science that sits behind the, the claims of provenance. What's unique about the Barossa Valley? What's unique about McLaren Vale? And what we will do is go into those regions and look at what little species that you can't see existing, little yeast and bacteria naturally occurring that are there on the grapes or in the soil or on the, on the vines. And we will culture them up, study them, do a genome sequence of them, that sort of thing, applying really high-end fundamental science to industry practical problems and then help those producers allow those indigenous microorganisms to help complete the fermentation and make a product that could not be copied because the, those species are unique to that vineyard, to that region. You can be in Italy, you couldn't copy it. South Africa, you couldn't copy it. France, you couldn't copy it. This is uniquely about South Australia. So we're, we're bridging advanced science, we're pursuing the, the fundamentals of science while also doing things uh, practically. And this is the sort of thing that uh, gets me out of bed in the morning. I, I love doing it. And of course, when you're working in the wine sector, the fringe benefits uh, are amazing. Uh, <laughs> We see about 25,000 wine, different wines in a year that come through our laboratories. It's about half of the wine made in Australia. The bottle comes in. We need this much out the top for our analysis. We're looking for different things just to make sure the consumer health and safety uh, uh, provisos are satisfied. And then the balance is available to staff. So this is the kind of thing that is a fringe benefit of working uh, in the wine sector. 
I might leave it there, Paul. We can come back to Q&A uh, later. No, no, I, th I think you've had them. <laughs> you've got them. They're nailed. They're in. They're in. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan, thank you very much. Sarah, the particular and peculiar story of South Australia, where it sits and the organizational structure that you drive and, and, and you represent on behalf of the wine community. Sure. Um, my name's Sarah Hills and I am the business services manager at the South Australian Wine Industry Association. We are an employer association within the wine industry. So for, um, and there's many different sorts of organisations that sit, as Dan indicated, underneath or behind the story that you see as the wine um, and that we drink and make and grow. Um, so my role there specifically, the, the organisation I'll start with actually is an advocacy type group. Um, so we have, and we cover off on environment, government policy that affects the wine industry. And in my area specifically, we deal with um, employment law for wineries, health and safety for wineries, and um, to some degree, workers' compensation. So we are there as an advice ad service to employers in the wine industry about how those laws affect their businesses. So they can ring us and ask us questions about that and we can guide them through what's legally right, a correct uh, procedure. Or we also have an advocacy arm, as I mentioned, um, which we interface between the government, the state government predominantly, or the federal government in relation to employment, um, and about getting what is the wine industry's view or position on a particular issue that affects those topics that I raised. And then we would advocate on behalf of the industry a view or what we need to see as um, part of the lawmaking process or the policy making process. And that's a lot broader than I can actually within my area. But uh, for example, we do a lot in relation to the election coming up. Um, so we look at different areas that it affect wine industry business. And then we'll advocate with the state government about what do we want to see in the coming government about the things that affect us and what do we need to um, the government to do to assist us. So that's uh, the organisation I work for. I've been there for approximately 12 years um, in, um, as advisory role and then I now am the manager for a small team of people. My journey to wine industry started in Darwin and was never on my radar. Um, I started a arts degree because I didn't know what I wanted to do. So doing psychology and sociology. And then that also, after a year of doing that, it gave me a foot in the door to do a law degree. So I was persuaded to go and do law. Um, straight out of coming out of school. Um, I took a gap year after year three. I'd had a bit of enough of, of the justice system at that point. Um, and I went and worked in a Chinese export company in Darwin ex and I was their payroll personnel. I did that for a year and a bit like Nadia said, I learned some things along the way. And one of those was that I wasn't going to progress very far up the food train very quickly. Although I had a lovely um, rapport with the people who ran the company, it was very interesting in, in terms of um, running a business. So I learned some skills and customer service skills. Um, but from that, I took, it gave me motivation to go back and finish my degree. And I really um, did really well in my last year. And then I got an internship or a, um, to do from where you need to, when you finish your law degree, you need to do a year with a company. Um, and then you can graduate um, from your articles, as it was called then. So I worked for a company, a commercial law firm in Darwin. Um, and I got a full spectrum of family law and uh, commercial transactions and property law. Um, and from there, I moved to another firm and did um, commercial transactions. So I practiced as a lawyer for about seven years. Um, and I moved to Adelaide in 2003. Um, and I worked at Norman Waterhouse doing local government law. So that was another change in career. Um, and I found that really fascinating governance um, and training. So I really enjoyed the side of trying to enter, interpret the law into a means of what did that actually mean on a day-to-day -day basis. And in my role as a councillor at a, a local government uh, council, what did I actually have to do and comply with in terms of my role as um, a councillor and meetings and etc. Um, but after seven years, I'd had enough of working 
six to seven days a week and decided that I needed a career change. So I moved into a governance role in a local council um, where I was offered a full-time job, but I actually decided to turn that down and I happened to meet someone who worked in the wine industry. So the then CEO of the South Australian Wine Industry Association, um, we had a chat and she said, we need someone to work in our industrial relations and um, safety area. And with my background as a lawyer, um, I could take on understanding those laws around those um, issues. And um, yeah, I took a job there as, and I saw it as exciting. I liked the politics of the policy issues around employment law and the interaction that it has on many different levels. So. Um, both at federal politics um, and state politics, and also then how do you disseminate the information about that such that people are good employers, and how do we help employers in the wine industry manage their employees um, and best practice situations. So that is really how I got to the association, and from there I do all manner of things. Um, we took, deal with um, training. Yesterday, I was in the Coonawarra training um, about risk management for events in wine and talking about biosecurity, um, not that that's my area, but for other organisations within um, the wine industry. There are people who look after disease within wine industry, and so we try to assist wine industry people who are running events to understand all the facets of running an event and risk managing that so that they can do the business of selling wine and people celebrating um, their wineries and their events, but in the background, um, our organisation is assisting them with compliance and that thing in the best way and most interesting way that that is possible to do. Um, so that's probably all for me. Thank you. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I'm um, not entirely sure what it says about an industry when all three of your panellists admit that they had no intention or no knowledge of joining that industry when their career path um, started. So I think that's interesting. And um, I'd have to confess that um, I fall into that bucket too. Um, maybe just as an overview to frame some of the observations that we've heard. Um, for me, Nadia, I found it completely um, compelling your invitation to consider quite the, the depth, diversity, and range of skills and discipline that ostensibly a wine industry needs, from sales and marketing through to HR, through to training, through to finance and uh, basic admin and accounting support. And I think that's a really good idea to look at what I think sometimes, as Dan has mentioned, is seen as a almost the industry has a penchant for presenting it as um, a small-scale artisan endeavor. In fact, in many instances, and certainly in the case of a multinational um, publicly owned company like Pernod Ricard, it's right at the cutting edge of international commerce and business, even if the traded product at the end of the day is, um, is wine or indeed spirits, both of which you do equally well. And all of the disciplines involved in that supply chain, everything from production through to consumer engagement is required in order to facilitate that exchange. Um, Dan, I love the challenge and I think it's a challenge that faces everybody, let alone a scientist, the ongoing challenge of proving that your, your individual contribution as well as your discipline and your metier is relevant. And I love the idea of applying hard science to um, validate some of the more soft measurements that we like to talk about in terms of wine, which often stray into um, the emotional mm. and uh, the evocative, what I call the softer measurements of the importance of place, but being able to identify tangible, real issues like microflora and fauna that actually make that idea of a sense of place something that is unique. And, of all the marketing terms, that's probably the most over-applied in wine because when it comes down to it, um, science and technology is endlessly interchangeable, sometimes almost instantly. And the ability to adapt and adopt 
other practices is almost universal. I think the one part of the equation which is unique and distinct is probably your longitude and your latitude and the weather and the microclimate yep. that comes with it. But the idea that we need science to actually understand what is quite a nuanced picture, I think is fascinating. And I think that interrelationship between hard measurement and soft measurement is kind of fascinating. And then, Sarah, really, uh, I, I wasn't aware of your commercial and or your legal background, um, rich and deep as it is. But then to use that on behalf of an industry in terms of, um, I think it was your phrase, ensuring best practice, both in terms of employers and how employees are looked after, I think um, it's easy to be cynical about sentiment. And I think the idea of best practice and uh, trust and governance and, dare I say it, integrity is increasingly really proud of a brand DNA. And I would like to think that as a national industry, the brand DNA of the Australian wine industry is strong. And certainly, I think um, the best practice view of what happens within this state and within South Australia is a strong and, and actually part of our competitive advantage. Hmm. So I think a fascinating overview from our speakers, but... Um, the real value, I think, of these sorts of exchanges is to offer you an opportunity to speak. And please don't feel that you can't, and please don't be unashamedly modest and sit on your hands. Um, we have industry experts here, and we have a bit of time on our hands, and we have mics that can be um, spread around by our team. So please take this opportunity. Uh, sir, perhaps if you could announce who you are once you've got the mic and then address the question to either an individual speaker or indeed the panel. But thank you very much. Hi, uh, my name is Brian. Uh, Dan, I have two questions for you about the work that uh, your organisation does. First of all, uh, looking at it as uh, the institution you are, is this something uh, prevalent across the world and most countries and growing regions do it? Or is this something that's emerged from this area? Is that the two questions? Or is that no, the first question? that's the one question. Okay, yeah. I'll answer that one. Uh, there are equivalent organisations to ours around the world. They tend to be departments of universities. So the same people that would be responsible, like professors, who give uh, the lectures to a student studying winemaking, for example, will also have a research program, usually on the side. So the, the, the nexus between research and education is considered very important. So they're academics. The point of difference that we have in Australia is that we have, in my case, an institution that's owned and controlled by the industry. So my board are grape growers and winemakers. They completely control the agenda. All of my team, there's 120 of us, are white lab coat wearing nerds, right? But the board are people who have skin in the game, they're really hard-nosed business people, they care about the product. So it's that nexus of, so what? The great, yay, we can do this, here's the great science, and so what? It's, that's the thing we do uniquely in Australia. Wow, oh, that's great. Uh, second question was, um, does your organisation also handle the social research side? I'm particularly interested in how it is that you determine what people are going to be drinking in three to five years so people can grow it now. Well, it's, it's next to impossible. Um, I think if we could do it well, we would have anticipated the rise of Sauvignon Blanc in New Zealand and uh, planted it en masse in Australia and been ahead of that curve, uh, which we didn't obviously do. Trends change, they, they, they come and go. And one of the things that we're seeing in the last five years, 10 years, and in growing, even in South Australia, and even in very close by in the Adelaide Hills, is a more artisanal movement. Small production, people working with minimal intervention. They're doing things a bit differently to what their parents did, their, their predecessors have done. And they're carving out quite an interesting niche. Now, 10 years ago, I, I probably couldn't have seen that coming. And I'm not sure many could have. So it's, it's very, very difficult to do. Um, well, certainly, we, we can't do it. Your broader question about social research is that there's a little bit done in terms of anticipating the next big variety, but really, 
globally, there's not that many varieties that dominate sales. It's Cabernet, it's Chardonnay, it's Shiraz. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a small number, Pinot, Chardonnay and so on, that dominate global sales, and then a smaller number that do carve a niche out. But the way people go about making it can change, and that's where these guys in the Adelaide Hills and other places are starting to do things uh, quite differently. Other dimensions of the social sciences are, however, a bit more actively deployed, and that includes things like understanding behavioural science, the, the choices that people make around packaging, why you would like this size format or that size, or why that label design appeals to you but not to you. There's quite a bit of that sort of social science that goes on, and it includes um, helping people to govern their, their own drinking choices, because there's a, a strong element of social responsibility uh, for our sector. So they're all elements. They're not hard sciences, they're not STEM sciences, but they're, they're still very relevant. Well, thanks very much, very enlightening. I think just to pick up on your question, sir, because I think it's really apposite a couple of observations, um, as well as at an institutional and R&D level, of course, the multinational brand owners like Perno drive an awful lot of consumer insight and research and are huge individual investors on where the market currently is and what the overriding trends are, particularly anticipating things like weight and texture and aromatics and um, where issues um, become potential challenges, like where the health lobby and um, regulation intersects with uh, the desire of an industry to aggressively market and the realization that at the end of the day, many of us are in the business of trying to get more people to drink more alcohol. And that, you know, quite legitimately has a very strong sense of um, social and corporate responsibility. So I think it's very fashionable from a marketing point of view to think that great product innovation and development has always been consumer driven. But sometimes it's also regulation driven. Sometimes it's, um, and increasingly without being too contentious, I think um, the idea that it's also environmentally driven. And one of the challenges that Australia faces, I think is not just what do consumers want to drink or what would they prefer to drink, but what is relevant for us as an industry that has particular challenges, specifically and particularly around temperature and the use of water. You know, that may well be as much of a driver for change as actually consumer sentiment. Mm -hmm. And then the challenge becomes engaging the consumer with these propositions that are more sustainable for us. So um, I think what's fascinating is the science and the protocols are changing all the time. And that we have a marketplace which is, no pun intended, very fluid. It is in constant flux. So the stimulus and the influence can come from many and varied um, areas. But thank you very much for your contribution. Another question from the audience. Yes, sir. Um, so from another Dan who started off wanting to cure cancer and is considering, you know, maybe shifting across, you know, this, this whole science adding a scientific aspect to the provenance of the wine, I think is really exciting. Um, for someone thinking about that transition, these days, are they going to need to go and do some viticulture, some agricultural science? Do they need an MBA? What, you know, is a Bachelor of Science with some experience going to be able to transfer across, or do you need to do a bit more study before you consider doing that? Thanks for the question. Yes, uh, so I did never studied winemaking or viticulture. I've learned the wine component of my job on the job, and plus my own private interest in the subject. So it's certainly not necessary to go and do viticultural winemaking. The, the transferable skill, which is always what people are looking for, in this case is the sciences, in, certainly for what we do. And it's not specific to wine, we can talk more broadly. 15 minutes to the southeast of where we are here is the Wake Campus of the University of Adelaide. There's a thousand scientists working on that campus. There's a lot more working just along the road here along North Terrace amongst the different Samries and other things. So there's, there's a lot of jobs out there for highly skilled professionals working in science across a lot of areas, including in agriculture and then more specifically in wine as part of that. MBA, also not necessary. Uh, there, are, there are roles, even within my organisation, for people who are 
can I, do I have two minutes to, to go of into course, the waterfront? Yeah, right. yeah, no, please. So bear with me. I, there's a little metaphor that I can use to explain, I think, this, this answer your question very succinctly. There's a, a model called the Joker's Quadrant model. All right? If you ask two questions when you do any kind of science, including in wine, then you get to the answer of where you should be working. If you answer the question, am I going to pursue, a, pursue fundamental understanding? If you say, and the other axis, by the way, is fundamental understanding on one axis, the other axis is uh, practical application. If you answer no to both of those questions, we call that the joker's quadrant. What are you doing? If it's not pursuing fundamental knowledge, not pursuing application, why are you bothering? If you pursue fundamental understanding but not application, there's still a place for that. That's what we call the Niels Bohr quadrant. He was the physicist, Nobel laureate, but couldn't have given a rat about what his physics led to. Ultimately, extremely important, but he personally couldn't have cared less. He just wanted to do great science. If you want to do application, but you don't care about fundamental science, we call that Edison quadrant. Thomas Edison, I'm going to take a thousand little wires until I find the one that makes the light bulb glow. I don't care why, all I care is that it works. And he made a lot of money, but he didn't really pursue the fundamentals of science. If you can answer yes to both questions, we call that the Pasteur quadrant, Louis Pasteur who had the most incredible personal motivation to do what he did, most of which has direct relevance to wine. Because the pasteurization process, he was the discoverer of yeast and bacteria and what the role they played in winemaking, all of that. That was born out of losing his daughter to a bacterial disease when she was about eight, and he devoted the rest of his life to this cause. He wanted to understand how do I control the winemaking process, and I want to understand why and how. I wanted to do the science behind it. It's a bit of a long way of answering your question, which is, do you need to do any one of those things? There are roles for the Niels Bohrs, the Thomas Edisons, and the Louis Pasteurs working in wine science, as there is in almost any other field of science. And even in my management team, there are people who don't have a PhD, but they do have a, science, a good understanding of science, a passion for wine, and a lot of expertise. Quick follow-up question, hopefully. Quick. Um, What's the competition like for roles within your institute then, for those, particularly the research, scientific research side of things? Uh, at a technical officer level, we've, we've got a number of roles going right now, so about uh, seven or eight. There's about 70 applications for each one, so it's pretty strong. If you're highly specialised, particularly if you can code um, and do bioinformatics, you can pretty much set your own salary and there'll only be one applicant for the job. So it all depends a little bit on the exact <laughs> nature of the role and exactly what you, know, what you can offer. I'll have one of those, please. <laughs> Paul, if I may, just yes, a segue cool. about the transferable skills. I think someone came up to me earlier about they have a degree in um, marketing, commerce and business and those sorts of diversity of skills that that person has c taken um, you, in a big company, you might have a specific role um, that those skills would still be relevant, but in, even in a small company that may only have five employees, they are looking to diversify what they can do. So you might do marketing in the cellar door for the busy weekend days and Fridays. In the downtime, those employers are looking for people to work, crunch the numbers. What's the sales? What does it take for me to sell at a discounted rate to still make a profit and, sus and maintain my sustainability? So those diversity of um, skills are really useful. And the other thing I think that um, Dan has highlighted and, and Nadia is that it's in, most employers are really looking for someone who's dri driven to, do, to learn, to ask the questions. And so you may not have a uni degree, but you might have skills, customer service skills, or just the working ethic that they're looking for and understanding and yearning to learn more. And I think all of those things have a pathway into a wine industry career. One of the biggest things that we face, I think, in the wine industry in South Australia is regional employment. And so we work, we are predominantly a regional-based employer set. Um, when I went to the Coonawarra yesterday, we are talking about, well, we need to encourage people why living in Coonawarra or the southeast is such a great thing. You're four hours from Melbourne, four hours from Adelaide. You've got the beach an hour away. I think those are the things that people should concentrate to because um, Barossa and McLaren Vale are very, and Adelaide Hills are very accessible from the CBD, but there's some great regions out there. And I think um, if you want a, a startup, then those are good places to look to. Fantastic. Thank you. 
Um, thank you for the questions. I think it really makes a difference. And um, I hope that has shone something of a light upon the opportunities and the justification of looking at the wine industry as a serious option for employment. I think that while I mentioned somewhat tongue in cheek that no one here, myself included, intended on that particular path, I, I think perhaps the closing observation is to consider the amount of time that we have now committed to it and I think we're all um, here to stay. So it, it seems compelling and convincing once you find the front door um, and I encourage you to look for the front door. So ladies and gentlemen, just in terms of concluding uh, the formalities and I'm sure the panelists can linger for a couple of minutes for those of you that are shy and retiring and couldn't speak from the floor but would like um, perhaps a word in their ear. Please joining me, please join me, I beg your pardon, in thanking Nadia, Sarah, and Dan. Um, I wish you well um, for the rest of the duration of JobX, and I hope this pro provides a spark of inspiration for you to consider the wine industry. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. <laughs>